Welcome to World Med School. My name is uh, Dr. Davidson Hamer. I'm a professor of international health and medicine at the Boston University Schools of Public Health and Medicine, but I'm also uh, director of research and evaluation at the Zambia Center for Applied Health Research and Development. In this um, microbiology lecture, I'm going to discuss malaria and pregnancy. So this slide shows uh, an overview of the burden of malaria in pregnancy. <clears throat> there are an estimated 45 million pregnancies that occur annually in malaria endemic areas. 23 million of these occur in high transmission areas of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, malaria has been shown to have a negative health impact for both mothers and newborns. For mothers, it uh, is responsible for severe anemia, an estimated 3 to 15 percent of all episodes of severe anemia among mothers, and up to 10,000 malaria anemia-related deaths uh, per year. In infants, malaria in pregnancy is estimated to be responsible for anywhere from 8 to 14 percent of all uh, episodes of low birth weight, and low birth weight is generally defined as a birth weight is of less than 2,500 grams, uh, but more notably for 30% of preventable low birth weight. In addition, malaria during pregnancy is responsible for 8 to 36% of prematurity and 3 to 8% of infant mortality, which is approximately anywhere from 75,000 to 200,000 infant deaths per year. So the presentation of malaria in pregnancy varies according to endemicity. Um, in endemic areas, you know, areas with higher intensity transmission, many mothers are asymptomatic or may have low-grade symptoms. Uh, they often are suffering from severe maternal anemia or at least moderate anemia, if not severe anemia. Their newborns are often born with low birth weight and there's an increased risk for both neonatal and infant mortality. In areas with lower transmission that are prone to epidemics of malaria, mothers are more likely to have more symptomatic episodes of malaria with complications including uh, severe anemia, cerebral malaria, respiratory distress, and potentially death. In addition, they have a risk of having a spontaneous abortion or miscarriage during the course of their pregnancy, uh, premature delivery, and then like high transmission areas, there's also risk of low birth weight um, and newborn mortality. Uh, this slide shows the cycle of malaria during pregnancy in high transmission areas. So fel Plasmodium falciparum is the main species of malaria that, that is, contributes to the burden of malaria during pregnancy, although in some areas of the world, Plasmodium vivax has been shown to be responsible, uh, but generally to a lesser degree. So in high transmission area, uh, falciparum malaria is associated with asymptomatic infection because there is, are high levels of acquired immunity. There's often parasite sequestration in the placenta. This leads to impaired nutrient transport uh, to, the, to the developing fetus and then eventually results in low birth weight of the baby. In addition, uh, the falciparum malaria leads to maternal anemia, which also may contribute to the development of a low birth weight uh, infant and uh, the uh, development of low birth weights associated with an increased risk of, of uh, newborn and infant mortality. So this shows uh, malaria parasites sequestering in the placental intervillous space and large numbers of, of parasitized erythrocytes may be found in the intervillous space. Um, Immunity uh, needs to develop at the level of the placenta. So as I'll show you shortly, um, infections in, the, in prima gravidas in women in their first pregnancy often tend to have more severe adverse consequences for both the mother and the baby. Uh, this figure shows uh, th that the density of, of placental parasitemia can be very high. In fact, it can be up to 90% or more of all placental red blood cells or erythrocytes infected with malaria parasite. This slide shows the, the evolution of malaria in pregnancy in low transmission areas. So as, as I mentioned previously, acquired immunity is low, so clinically symptomatic illness is much more common. Uh, this may progress to severe disease, which uh, may, may, with the ultimate complication potentially of death, and this bears uh, a risk to the mother and the fetus of, of uh, complications. 
um, this slide shows a few, uh, actually the next few slides are going to describe some, some important facts about malaria and pregnancy from studies that have been conducted in sub-Saharan Africa. First of all, pregnant women are more susceptible to malaria than non-pregnant adults. This is a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, in 2000. It shows the relative uh, odds of plasmodium falciparum parasitemia at different points in time uh, with um, an odds ratio of 1.0 in the year before pregnancy. There's a, a, about a two-fold increase in the first trimester, a two-and-a-half-fold increase in the second trimester, similar two-fold increase in the third trimester. Shortly after delivery, the, the risk drops but is slightly higher than in the year before pregnancy. And then 60 days postpartum, the, the risk drops back to the similar levels to the time before pregnancy. So malaria is more frequent and more severe among nulliparous women compared to multiparous women. This uh, data is one example of many showing differences between prima gravida, so women in their first pregnancy, uh, secunda gravida, second pregnancy, and then multigravida. And as you can see, the, the, the y-axis shows the frequency of placental malaria in figure A, and then figure B, the placental parasite density. And both the frequency of placental infection and the density of infection are highest in prima gravida. Um, and then with uh, the frequency of infection drops progressively with, with gravidity. <clears throat> An important additional fact is that, that you may have placental parasitemia in the absence of peripheral parasitemia. Um, and this slide uh, shows a, a regression analysis comparing placental parasitemia to peripheral parasitemia at delivery. So another complicating factor is HIV. And HIV infection increases the risk for both peripheral and placental parasitemia. Uh, this is from a, a review paper published about uh, nine years ago. And basically, the, the HIV-infected women have a relative risk of 1.6 of having peripheral parasitemia. Um, which is a significant difference, and then uh, they have a similar level of uh, increased relative risk of having placental parasitemia. Uh, this slide summarizes a large body of, of studies on the interaction between HIV infection and malaria in pregnancy. So HIV-positive pregnant women have been shown to have a higher prevalence of malaria parasitemia, higher parasite densities, a greater risk of placental infection, increased risk of anemia, and an increased risk of birth complications, including low birth weight, prematurity, and intrauterine growth retardation. Placental malaria in HIV-infected pregnant women may increase the risk of HIV mother-to-child transmission, although there are mixed findings in, in some studies with not all showing an increased risk of mother-to-child transmission. And then infants of HIV-infected pregnant women are at greater risk of serious malaria, morbidity, or, and mortality. So there are a number of opportunities for intervention to try and reduce the burden of malaria in pregnancy. Um, uh, in areas of Africa where there are, are large uh, proportions of low birth weight, um, many women, you know, more than 60%, in fact, in many areas, more than 90 to 95% attend antenatal clinics. So delivery of interventions at the uh, point of care of the antenatal clinics is a, a significant feasibility in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there are medications, so intermittent preventive treatment um, is, is one strategy that's been widely used, and I'm going to say a few more words about that in a minute. Case management, really treating only those who are symptomatic, is less effective, although intermittent screening and treatment is a strategy that's now being tried uh, as an alternative to intermittent preventive treatment. So intermittent screening and treatment consists of screening every pregnant woman at each of her antenatal clinic visits with a rapid diagnostic test for malaria or a blood smear, and then, if she's positive, treating her with artemisinin-based combination therapy. Insecticide-treated bed nets are an important uh, mode for prevention, and then, obviously, management of anemia with iron and folic acid supplementation and, and nutritional counseling are important. Uh, this shows an insecticide-treated net donation antenatal clinic uh, near Blantyre, Malawi. So, so many clinics provide an, anti, a, an ITN uh, during the uh, first booking for pregnant women. So ITNs um, have been shown in 
a number of studies and then in, in uh, reviews, uh, systematic reviews, to decrease peripheral parasitemia, um, anemia in the mother, to reduce the risk of placental malaria, preterm delivery, and lead to an increase in mean birth weight. There's about a 25% decrease in infants who are born premature or small for gestational age among women sleeping under um, ITNs. Um, and the supply of ITNs in sub-Saharan Africa has been increasing, but there remain disparities between urban and rural populations. And clearly there's still a need to increase access to and use of ITNs by pregnant women. Uh, this slide shows the strategy of intermittent preventive therapy with a two-dose strategy. And basically, this is usually given in the second trimester and the third trimester with one dose of sulfadoxine permethamine or Fancidar uh, once in each trimester. Um, an alternative to this is a monthly dosing strategy where a dose of SP is given during uh, starting after quickening, so basically the beginning of the second trimester, monthly until shortly before delivery. There are a lot of data on the use of SP for intermittent preventive treatment of pregnancy. Um, more recent evidence, although early evidence um, suggested that a two-dose regimen was, was effective in, in most women, although some studies suggested that in HIV-infected women, a monthly dosing was more effective. Because of rising SP resistance, because of the use of SP in other populations, in the same areas, uh, there's now fairly widespread SP resistance with quintuple mutations um, that uh, really have impaired its, its, its efficacy, in, in, at least in young children. Um, because of rising resistance, um, it, it appears that monthly dosing is more effective in leading to improved birth outcomes and reduced maternal anemia than the two-dose regimen. As a consequence, the World Health Organization recently reviewed the evidence and in 2012 recommended monthly dosing beginning after quickening. Um, but these findings also emphasize the urgent need to evaluate alternative medications for IPT and potentially new strategies such as IST, intermittent screening and treatment. So, that was a very brief summary of, of uh, malaria in pregnancy. It's responsible for a substantial amount of, of burden. Um, we do have effective interventions, including ITNs, IPT, and then um, intermittent screening and treatment, which we'll have a lot more data on in the next few years.